Today on Twin Cam, we're returning to the glorious brownness of some of my most successful videos. And I think that says just as much about you lot as it does about me. Today's car is from yet another troubled, confusing and convoluted source. For this is the final example of an Anglo-French collaboration funded by the Americans. For this is Chrysler Europe's last stand, the Horizon. Our starting point is, of course, how this car came to exist in the first place. And to understand that, we need to know how and why Chrysler came to Europe in the first place. So it's time to travel back to the mid-1960s for a bit of a history lesson. For the first time on Twin Cam, we're travelling across the Atlantic Ocean to the United States of America where three companies have dominated the motor industry for the best part of a century. General Motors, Ford and Chrysler have been the stalwarts of North American motoring, but only two of them successfully crossed the water over to Europe. In the 1920s, General Motors bought out Britain's Vauxhall and Germany's Opel, growing the two marks over the decades to build some of the continent's most popular cars. Ford, on the other hand, built its company from scratch, opening several major plants, including the largest car plant in Europe, at Dagenham in England, to become the company that built the best-selling car in Britain for 50 years. Chrysler, on the other hand, had never really made a mark outside of North America, and they looked on at the other two with envy. As the 1950s progressed, Ford and GM continued to grow, and Chrysler took their first steps into Europe, buying 15% of the French company Simca. Founded in 1930, Simca was itself founded out of collaboration and expansion, originally from Fiat and eventually snatching up Ford's French operations in 1954, then the struggling Talbot in 58. It was in that same year that Chrysler took their stake, buying their shares from, of all companies, Ford. Over the following decades, Chrysler increased their influence by slowly eating away at Fiat's stake in Simca, taking a controlling share in 1963 and renaming the company as Chrysler France in 1970. In the meantime, Chrysler was also dabbling with the British motor industry. In 1964, they acquired a 30% share in the Roots Group, which was, again, the result of a number of buyouts. The Roots brothers gradually acquired themselves a healthy share of the British motor industry through buying companies such as Hillman and Humber in the late 1920s, but were struggling to keep their models up to date as the 60s progressed. By 67, Chrysler had full control, and these two French and British divisions formed two-thirds of Chrysler Europe. While the American arm of the business had previously sold a few of its models on this side of the Atlantic, the European consumer found them completely unsuitable. This was why Ford and GM both allowed their European arms to act independently of their American parents, and Chrysler followed this precedent, getting Roots and Simca to collaborate and produce a coherent new range of Chrysler cars for Europe. Their tasks were divvied up into two, with Roots taking the styling and Simca the engineering, as these were the fields in which Chrysler thought they excelled. For example, the Roots Group had gained itself a bit of a reputation for designing American-influenced and really quite cool-looking cars that, at the same time, were conservative enough to appeal to anyone from anywhere. Simca, on the other hand, had produced cars that were recognisably very French. And while that was all well and good, it just made sense from a marketing department to let the British attack the styling. But on the other hand, Simca were already deep into the world of front-wheel drive, and thanks to BMC, Fiat and Volkswagen joining that train, it was clear where the future lay, and this advancement was something Roots had avoided by launching cars like the rear-engined Hillman Imp. Their first ground-up collaboration was the big Chrysler Alpine, launched in 1975. And while a few other European Chryslers were knocking about, 
The car we have here today was the second genuine ground up collaboration. And this was the important one, as it had the potential to be their biggest seller, as Chrysler's competitor to the Volkswagen Golf, Opel Cadet and Ford Escort. And it became 1978's Chrysler Horizon. But before getting into this car itself, there's a bit more history to deal with, as the 1970s were the pivotal decade in dictating the layout and style of the accepted modern car. The car that grew to define the modern small hatchback was the iconic Volkswagen Golf, launched in 1974. It was small, stylish, had a hatchback and a transverse engine front-wheel drive layout. Over the following decade, it would become the blueprint that all manufacturers would follow, and only a few weeks after its launch, Chrysler began work on their equivalent. But while the name may be new, these two companies had histories of their own, so the Horizon would be replacing a pair of very different small family cars. The better of the two was the enormously successful and very advanced Simca 1100. But also in mind was the slightly larger and conventionally engineered but very stylish Hillman Avenger. The fact that the Simca was so successful, selling over 2 million units, and the fact that Volkswagen had actually used it as an exemplar of what they wanted the Golf to become, meant it made perfect sense for the Horizon to lend its philosophy from the French. So under the skin of the Horizon is essentially a developed version of the old Simca 1100, and nowhere is that clearer to see than under the bonnet. The petrol engines on offer were all variants of the same proven overhead valve four-cylinder Poissy engine, as used by Simca back to 1961. It's a rather simple little engine, but for its time was powerful and very efficient. For the Horizon, it was available as an 1118, a 1294, or in this posh Horizon GLS, at a 1442cc capacity, confusingly referred to as a 1.5 for reasons. But this nearly 1.5 litre power unit delivers around 82 brake horsepower and 91 pound-feet of torque, and that's very respectable for the late 1970s. But there's an issue here that will start to rear its head throughout our discussion of the Horizon's engineering, and that's the fact that it failed to do anything different to the little 1100 that came before. As I've mentioned, the 1100 was a fantastic car, and with other manufacturers delving into the world of front drive, Simca saw themselves as something of an early adopter. But simply reusing the same power unit in their new car wasn't going to win over many new buyers. While the 1100 was in full flow, Fiat had moved into that market with the likes of the 128 and 127, and they were using all new overhead cam engines. And when Volkswagen launched the Golf in 74, that too had overhead cam engines. This meant that the Horizon, in 1978, still had an overhead valve engine. And that's not a criticism as such, as overhead valve engines served many manufacturers very well all the way through into the 1990s. But it didn't move the game on at all. What was a very good engine in the 60s and 70s was looking old hat by the early 80s, and many period reviews criticised the Horizon for having a rough, tappity engine in a way that reviewers in 1967, when the 1100 was launched, hadn't even clocked. But while the petrol engines in the Horizon were well known, there was one rather significant later addition. We'll get into the later history of the Horizon in a few minutes, but in 1982 this car became the first recipient of what became the seminal mainstream diesel engine, PSA's XUD. In the Horizon, this oil burner was naturally aspirated, displaced 1905cc, and may have only produced 65 brake horsepower, but all the qualities of that great engine, when compared to the flaws of the petrols, might actually make it the pick of the bunch, and something of a lost gem in the turbulent history of this car.
But back to Simca, and the suspension is also the same system from the 1100, with torsion bars at the front and trailing arms with coil springs at the rear. So although the Horizon is a larger car than the 1100 with a very different body shell, it is very much a similar car underneath. And this was an issue that concerned contemporary testers, as though the car rode very well and performed adequately, it only performed adequately. The clearest indication of this was in Watcar's group test, where the Horizon was placed right in the middle of the bunch. So even if the Simca engineering was fine, it would need a lot more in its favour to make it sell. The styling, of course, is the British element of the Horizon, and within the former Roots group it came down to a man named Roy Axe to shape the identity of the new Chrysler range. As these cars would be badged as Chryslers, the Americans wanted a whole new look for their range, not being bound by the previous regime at Roots, so the Alpine and Horizon were part of a completely fresh slate. Having said that, the very first models had a rather Simca-esque rear-end treatment, with the characteristic kick-up into the pillar. But once Axe began his sketches, he shunned any relation to Simca, opting for that completely new character that emulated the Golf in many ways, full of straight edges with a wedgy silhouette. But although a direct visual link to Simca was removed, all of Axe's early sketches featured Simca badges, and in France the final car carried not only a Chrysler badge, but a Simca one as well, indicating the origin of the car's engineering and the relative power the brand had on the continent. But back to the styling and the horizon is, very unapologetically, a nice big box in the finest 1970s tradition. At the front, it has an aerodynamic smoothed-off face, with flush-fitting headlamps and wraparound indicators, as well as a full plastic bumper on this model. And all these features were just coming into fashion in the late 70s, so from this angle, the Horizon is fresh and bang up to date. At the back too, the tail lamps are wide and the rear screen deep, all for the sake of visibility and there is the faintest shade of that Simca notch in the unique dishing around the rear screen. So all seems very good, but when we come round to the sides, we begin to realise that the overall silhouette is rather frumpy, and the detailing is very unrefined. The influence of the Golf is most pronounced in the C-pillar, which is rather big for a car of the era. And in achieving that angle, the rear end juts out very far from the back of the doors. It leaves acres of blank, undefined bodywork. There is a defined belt line, highlighted on this GLS by a coach line that flows from the top of the headlamps and tail lamps around the flanks of the car, and at bumper level, a rubbing strip. But these look slightly out of place. In fact, Every bolt-on component looks out of place. The door handles, for example, are too big, too ugly, and probably too low as well. The rubbing strips are too low as well, and with the bumpers at the same level, it almost looks as though the car is melting down into the ground. It's just too slab-sided. And then to go alongside this are the wheel arches that are far too defined for a car of this size. They're huge and they emphasise the slab sidedness and make the track look too narrow as well. It's unimaginative, it lacks presence, and it has no flair to it whatsoever. And when put side by side with something like the Golf, the horizon rather falls flat on its face. It's not a good looking car, and with the Giajaro Pen Golf looking so incredibly good, this is another factor in the horizon's upbringing that rather stunted its performance in the marketplace. It was just too boring looking, and that's a massive shame, I think, as the Chrysler Sunbeam, launched only the year before, is a very clean, good-looking car, and the two have a clear family resemblance, but the far more important Horizon seemed to have drawn the short straw. For me, I'd have a very early base model Horizon, with chrome in the bumpers and no rubbing strips, 
as I think these models have a sense of industrialism and utility to them that really endears it to me, for some perverted reason. And for all the Americans watching, yes. Yes, it does share its styling with the Plymouth Horizon and Dodge Omni, because Chrysler. However, the European and American Horizons don't actually share that much. They have completely different front suspension, different engines, and even the complexities in the bodywork are different. So though they're from the same parentage and look almost identical, they're tuned to meet the needs of their respective markets. So this, if you thought it might be, really isn't a Europeanized Plymouth. That's a topic for a different video. Inside the Horizon, we swap the glorious brownness for even more glorious beigeness, and we also swap the very subtle Frenchness but quite nondescript exterior for something that screams French. Having said that the British were in charge of the styling of the car, it feels French. It does not feel like a British car at all. There is just an aura to the materials, to the design, to the seats that just feel unmistakably French. So let's start with the seats. They are big and they are comfy and they are very soft and they are beige. They are tremendously comfortable seats. They just feel like armchairs, which to be honest, they might not be as supportive as some of the seats, but they're just so soft and squishy that this feels like it could be in your living room. And they look like they could be in someone's living room in 1983 as well. Um, but they don't, aren't quite in the right kind of position because you sit exceptionally high in the horizon. I don't know whether you can see, but it looks to me in my viewfinder that my head is slightly in the shadows. And that's because I'm only five foot nine and I've only got about that much headroom. So that's not really a great sign. And also the steering wheel feels, feels very, very low in comparison. So I'm catching my legs on this huge two-spoke steering wheel. Two-spoke, obviously, so you can see the dials better. And that brings us to the dashboard and the dials themselves, because the instrument panel is very steeply raked backwards like that. Um, and that's completely the opposite to the dashboard, which is raked the other way. And that looks really quite good. And it also makes the car feel very spacious because the dashboard is very, very far away from you. It's very, very close to the windscreen. And so you feel like there is space to breathe in the car. You don't feel like, I mean, despite the fact that it's a relatively small car, you don't feel like the dash is intruding into the interior. This car is a Horizon 1.5 GLS which means it's the top of the range. And that means you get a few little goodies like electric windows, a cassette player, and a digital clock. But besides the goodies, there isn't something like a sunroof up here, for example. In fact, the headlining is just hard and a lot of the plastics are quite hard. In fact, no, that's soft actually, to be fair to it. Uh, but a lot of it is very, very cheap. And unfortunately, the bits that feel cheap are the switches. So these stalks, for example, feel very, very cheap. The buttons down here feel very, very cheap. And it's not laid out very well either, because while you've got the instruments ahead of you, a big row of warning lights, everything you need in front of you, some switches down here, the choke, everything around this side of the dash feels very normal. And then they've gone and put the heater controls right in the corner here, so only the driver can access them. I just don't understand the rationale behind that, but that's what they did and um, the levers and the fan switch. They feel horrendously cheap. So yeah, it's all very French. It seems sensible and when you start to look deeper, it is cheap and strangely designed. But still, the seats are very, very comfortable. That's a good thing at least. But the Horizon's interior with its little foibles, etc., feels very normal. It feels very acceptable, very standard for a late 70s car and the beigeness really helps. But there's one feature in this interior which isn't unusual. It's absolutely incredible. And that's one of the bits that you get with this being a GLS. Because instead of having a standard tachometer as part of the instrument cluster, they instead tack onto the top of the steering column a digital rev counter. That's just the coolest thing I think I've ever seen in a standard, normal family car from the late 70s. But almost immediately after the Horizon was launched, everything began to fall apart. 
Back in the States, Chrysler was hemorrhaging money and its European operations really weren't helping matters, so they got rid. After over a decade of ownership, Chrysler was still producing the likes of the Avenger, the Hunter and the little Simca 1100, all of which were cars from the old Roots Group and Simca regimes. And alongside these now outdated and out of place models were a bit of a mismatch of new and revised cars. The Chrysler 180 was the first unified Chrysler Europe launch, but it was treated like a game of ping pong between Roots and Simca and it failed. The Alpine and Horizon were, as I've said, the two major launches, but alongside them were a few niche models, including the Chrysler Sunbeam, which was a cut down version of the Avenger, and the Matra Rancho, which is now a cult hero. But none of this was conducive to a successful business. In 1978, the same year that the Horizon was launched, Chrysler sold out to Peugeot for a single dollar. PSA quickly took the Chrysler branding off the cars, replacing the Pentastars with a revival of the Talbot name, a mark that had been snatched up by Roots in the 1930s. And so, within only a year of being on sale, the Little Horizon had been orphaned by its parent and relaunched under a mark that nobody had heard from in 20 years. It's difficult to ascertain the true impact of this change on both the public's perception of and confidence in the cars. But what we can tell for sure is that the horizon got off to a very healthy start, especially in France. And production in Britain began in 1982, a fact that the company hoped would draw buyers from the likes of Ford and Vauxhall. The Horizon was even named European Car of the Year in 1979. But this wasn't to last very long. While the Horizon was a fine car, it was only fine. The lack of anything new under the skin and the styling that was just very average became a sales hindrance within only a few years. The reality of a car that wasn't all it was cracked up to be was that it very quickly became less than the sum of its parts, and British buyers failed to take it to their hearts, the horizon quickly disappearing from the higher end of the sales charts. Although the Simca, Chrysler or Talbot horizon had a fair old run, seeing life through to 1987, it was discontinued to a murmur and there was no new mid-sized Talbot to replace it. In fact, all the Horizon stablemates had been culled in the years prior, and this was the last of the breed, and this badge was never to be seen again on a car. What was Talbot, what was Chrysler Europe, what was Simca, and what was Roots had all been consigned to history. But the story of the Horizon and of Chrysler Europe isn't just a black hole of industrial failure. Before American ownership, both Simca and Roots had produced some very popular and very well-regarded cars, and that didn't stop once the Hillman, Simca and Talbot badges disappeared. In the early 1980s, what was Chrysler Europe were working on a new mid-sized family car, a replacement for the Horizon. And that car was slated to be launched as the Talbot Arizona. Of course, that never happened, but Peugeot did get their hands on it, facelifted it and rebadged it as the Peugeot 309. And that car was produced by Simca and Roots. And the 309 successor was, of course, the brilliant Peugeot 306, again produced by Simca and Roots. And if we follow that lineage through to the present day, we get to the current Peugeot 308. So although the names no longer exist, the Horizon has a direct modern descendant. And on that note, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.